Okay, hey class, how's it going? So this is going to be our week six lecture on obsessive compulsive disorder. So I have a special guest host with me. Hi, my name is Ariana. I am also a lecturer for Psych 238. There you go. So sections I and J, sections C and D, this is going to be your lecture for the week. So if you have any questions, of course, though, you're going to email Ariana if you're in her sections, and you're going to email me if you're in my sections, all right? And if you email me, put Psych 238 in the subject line of the email. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. But of course, before we get started with the lecture, we're going to have a quick word from our corporate sponsors. Do you have corporate sponsors for your lecture? I do not have corporate sponsors. You don't have corporate sponsors either. <laughs> okay, yeah. let's keep it going. All right, everybody. So this is going to be the video. I would recommend that you go ahead and you know get your notes out, get something to write with. What we're going to do, we're just going to watch the video. I'm going to talk about a lot of things. If we see something that we want to add, I'll pause. We'll talk about it. Of course, I'll have this microphone muted. So we'll jump back and forth, yada, yada, yada. It'll be nice and easy. You know the drill. For those of you in C and D, you might be unfamiliar with this. This is what I do. The first part of this video is going to be me yelling at my class from last semester about all the problems they were having. So some of you are having these similar problems. So maybe this applies to you. Maybe it doesn't. But uh, if I need to change anything, I'll jump in and make those changes. All right. Do you ever yell at your students? I have not yelled at my students. Okay. This is the first time that my students see my face. Oh, yeah. Hey, look. There you Hi, go. Hi. This is your instructor. Okay. There you go. That's great. That works out. Okay. Let's, let's watch. Hello, class. This is going to be our week six lecture on obsessive compulsive disorder. Go ahead and make sure that you're taking notes. Make sure that you're doing the readings on Compass and the reading quizzes and the participation points. If you have any questions, go ahead and send me an email about course content. So let's go ahead and get started. Before we go right into the lecture, we're going to spend a little bit of time just going over some updates for the course. I want to talk to you about the quizzes. I want to talk to you about assignment number one. I want to talk to you about curving of grades. I want to talk to you about the formula for academic success. And I want to go ahead and talk to you about emails. Now, if you feel like none of this applies to you, go ahead and click the timestamp in the video. I'm just joking. I don't have that functionality, but this is going to be the time code when I'm done with this. And you can just skip ahead to this point if you don't want to hear any of this, if this doesn't apply to you. So first things first, let's talk about the quizzes. We're going to have quizzes every two weeks from here to the end of the semester, which means you're going to need to learn how to condense your studying habits and be more efficient with your time. So we're not going to have like a month or two between quizzes for the rest of the semester. It's going to be pretty much every other week, we're going to have a quiz until the end of the semester. So what I would encourage you to do is look through the readings, try to condense all the information in the readings into a few main points. I, what I'd like for you to do, do the reading once, go all the way through the reading, then think about it, hmm, what do I understand about this reading? What don't I understand? Then I want you to go ahead and read through it a second time. Anytime you see a word or a concept, anything you don't understand, I want you to write that down and then look at the definition and then rewrite that definition in a way that you can remember it. It's not about memorization. It's about learning and understanding. What does this mean? A lot of times I'll say, hey, what's etiology? People say, well, it's like when you have the, f and, you're, and you're looking for that. It's like, no, no, no. Don't put a bunch of words in there. Make it real simple for yourself. Etiology is the study of causes. And that's it. That's it. This so makes it easy for me. Epidemiology is another one. I say, well, hey, what's epidemiology? Because, uh, uh, you know, it's like the thing with the thing. It's the study of prevalence, the study of rates, the rates of, this, of a disease in a society, of mental health disorders. So make it easy for yourself. After I've written down all the definitions and everything, and I'm figuring it out for myself, then what I want to do is look through the paragraphs and try to whittle down each paragraph to what's the point of this paragraph. So look at these paragraphs, try to whittle it down. What's the main point of this paragraph? What's the author trying to communicate to me? And some of our readings, there are sections. Try to figure out what is the theme of this section? And then you can expand it from this section to what is the theme of this paper? Like what is what is the author trying to communicate to me? So that's something that I want to talk about a little bit more in the formula for academic success. But it comes to the quizzes, everything on Compass is fair game, all the readings, all the videos, and the lecture. That's all fair game for the quiz. Just watch the lecture. Take notes during the lecture. If you can, watch it twice. Listen to it once like a podcast. That's all up to you, right? I'm gonna leave that up to you how you spend your time. I recommend doing everything twice, but we'll talk about that later when we go to the uh the formula for academic success. So now let's talk about assignment number one. Nobody had actually watched the video that I posted in August about assignment number one. Um, that very few, yeah, so some of the dates that I use in this video are from the fall. So I say like August and then I say like December, but that doesn't apply for you. So this semester, not only did I have the video that I posted in the fall, I also posted a second video. So I noticed that some people hadn't watched either video. So I'm just putting that out there. I'm just putting that out there. I put the videos for you. Listen, I can't talk to you any other way. I can't talk to you any other way. I'm not in lecture. I don't see you. 
The only way I can communicate with you is through emails and videos. So, you know, I really care about your grade. I want to help you out, but you know what I'm saying? All right, there we go. People had read my emails about assignment number one. I want to encourage you to start working on your assignments as soon as possible. So right now you've finished assignment number one, right? You should start working on part two. So assignment part one is done. Now start working on assignment part two. Right now, start working on it right now. And then when you receive your feedback from assignment one, you can apply that feedback to part two, which is why you should probably be making sure that all of my emails are going to your inbox and they're not going to your spam folder. I will no longer answer questions. 48 hours before it's due, I'm stopped answering questions. So I want you to start working on this early. If you're working on something right before it's due, I, I encourage you to think Think ahead of time, look through your schedule. If you wait to the last minute, trust me, something always comes up last minute. So the pressure of you waiting to the last minute compounds with the other things that you have going on in your life. Start a little earlier, outline your document, do it early. So that way the night before, two days before, rather than you actually trying to write your whole assignment and you're not doing citations, the formatting is all wrong, you don't have the right amount of pages, you don't have a reference page, everything's wrong, there's misspellings, like all of that happens in the last minute. Instead of having that issue at the last minute, now, because you've done this step by step, you can catch all your mistakes in the last 24 to 48 hours. Assignment number two is gonna be due in December. That's about two months from now. I would encourage you to start working on it now. I wanna to try to break you of this habit of waiting to the last minute. So that's assignment number one. So let's move on to curving. Under no circumstances should you ever email me and ask me if I'm going to curve anything. Don't do it. Do not email me to ask me about curving assignments. I will never curve an assignment if you ask me to curve it. I use statistical methods to figure what needs to be curved, what doesn't need to be curved. So you don't get to ask me what, what I curve. You don't get to request it. You see what I'm saying? All right, so that's curving. Don't, no, I'll decide. I'll decide what gets curved. Formula for academic success is for every one. I do want to say this. No one this semester has yet asked me to curve anything. So kudos to you. That was a big problem last semester. Everybody was like, curve everything. No, no, no. we ain't curving nothing. You curve stuff? I don't curve stuff. There we go. We ain't curving nothing. Credit hour you are enrolled in, you should spend two to three hours outside of class studying material. When I was an undergrad, I was taking anywhere between 20 to 24 credit hours per semester. So I was doing a lot of work and I was doing research, part-time working. I don't recommend that for anybody. I really wasn't doing it on the weekend, but studying and working, right? I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. That's what I was doing. Take a, take a reasonable course load. When it comes to this course, this is a three credit hour course. So you should be spending anywhere from two to three hours studying for course material. But I would encourage you to be spending spending six to nine hours per week total. This course is designed for you to be spending a significant amount of time studying for the material. You're gonna put some time into it. For those of you who are like, oh, Walter, what about X, Y, Z? Well, you know, priorities. What do you want me to say? I mean, set your priorities. I'm not gonna tell you how to spend your time. I'm gonna tell you how you would need to spend your time in order to succeed in this course. If you want to go to graduate school, if you want to go to medical school, if you wanna get any kind of advanced degree, I would start disciplining yourself now rather than realizing, oh no, I have to like prioritize my time. Develop it now. If this is your first semester in college, whatever worked for you in high school, you need to step that up. I don't care if you were presidents, Roll dean's list, whatever you did in high school, that's cool, but you're not in high school no more. You need to step it up. So I would encourage you in this first semester of college, build healthy habits for your future. So some people say, oh, you know, there's, oh, I'm an undergrad. I shouldn't have to do high level work. I'm an undergrad. No, 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 don't be that person. Be the person who's like, this is where I wanna be in life. This is where I wanna go. So I'm gonna work like I'm there. When I was an undergrad and I was working towards graduate school, I was studying for the GRE, trying to get good grades and everything. I wasn't working like I was an undergrad. I was working like I was a graduate student, talking to graduate students in my department. I met all the people in the psychology program. I was hanging out with yahoos. I was hanging out with people who were about that life. Professors, graduate students, people who wanted to be graduate students. So I'm spending my time with people who are successful. Therefore, I became successful because I learned successful habits. You have to set your own priorities and you have to work for the job that you want, not the job that you have. You know what I'm talking about? So you're gonna need to figure out where you wanna be in life and work towards that. I know it's tough, but you're still gonna have to figure something out. So on top of the form of academic success, what I'm actually talking about here, I'm talking about time management. So all that whole big rant I just did, uh, you know, that all, that all counts right here. Form of academic success, I'm talking to you about time management. How do you spend your time? How do you set your time? How do you prioritize your time? If you actually want to be a clinician or researcher, then maybe you should think about stepping up your game. So 
That's it for formula of academic success. Any questions on that, send me an email. Speaking of email, that's free advice you didn't ask for, but you got it anyways. That's just a little snapshot of the kind of things I had to do to get to graduate school. And I did it in my 30s and you guys were in your 20s. Some of y'all like 19 and stuff. So I'm just encouraging you. I'm just encouraging you to like really take this seriously. It's a little bit different from high school, a little more efforts involved, especially now that things are all messed up with the pandemic. I would definitely encourage you to contact your instructors via email, try to talk with them and learn about what you can do to be successful in this environment. Trust me, I've adapted pretty well to this environment. I don't know how about you. I had a similar experience, to be honest. Um, what you said is very true. I don't think that you can become a professional in any field unless you develop the habits now. So there you go. We're just like giving you some free advice you didn't ask for. Emails, let's talk about emails. I really want you to check your emails to make sure that they are coming to your inbox. I feel like there are individuals who do not check their emails due to, I don't know, they just don't care, or my emails are going to a spam folder. You need to check for my emails. Type in Walter in your inbox and just see what comes up. Make sure that my emails are not in your spam folder, that they're coming to your inbox. I'll send emails every week. These include reminders for assignments. These include updates to the course. You're responsible for that information. You got to check your emails. You want to be responsible for that. So learn those skills now. Check your emails and you're responsible for what's in the emails. Part of the course is checking your emails. If you're not checking your emails, that's on you. All right. So that, and if you're in a section C and D, uh, don't type Walter into your email inbox, type uh, Ariana in there. Uh, so like, make sure that you're getting your emails from your instructors into your inbox. Sometimes the spam folder catches your emails. Um, I use the Outlook app, but I know a lot of people use the Gmail app through the university. Down, sometimes weird stuff happens. Just double check, make sure you're getting all your emails. How about you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I concur. Okay, there you go. Ends my little rant about everything you need to know about Psych 238. Now we're gonna get to the lecture. In this lecture, we're gonna go over OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, other related disorders. We're gonna talk about the etiology, talk about some epidemiology, we're gonna talk about treatment. I have some videos here, some of them don't work. If you're watching this on YouTube or Cultura, and I say, hey, here comes a video, and then there's no video, please go to the study videos folder on Compass, and all the videos will be there. But before we get into our lecture, let's go over some quick review. So Sydney had repeated panic attacks in her 20s, most of her panic attacks happened in public places, like on the bus, at work, in the subway, etc. Sydney's family has become concerned because she has not left her apartment in several months without great difficulty. Sydney expresses that she doesn't want to leave the house because she doesn't want to have a panic attack somewhere where she can't leave. Which of the following should she be diagnosed with? Hmm. hmm. So remember, when these questions, these review questions come up, make sure you're taking them seriously. This is a way for you to quiz yourself, prep yourself for the other exams we have coming up. So remember, here's the tips. You read the question one time, then you read all the responses. You read the question a second time, you pick your two favorite responses. You read the question a third time, you lock in your favorite answer and you move on. All right, so when these come up, make sure you're paying attention to these. These are the participation points. I'm checking my participation points. People are getting like twos out of fives. Yo, all the answers are in the lecture. Well, for now, all the answers are in the lectures. I get a little tricky later in the semester, but just watch the videos, have your quiz open while you're doing it. I don't know how you do your participation. Exactly points. the same way. I have all of the answers of my participation questions within the lectures. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. All right. A, generalized anxiety disorder. B, specific phobia. C, social phobia, D, agoraphobia, E, specific anxiety attack disorder. All right, let's go ahead and lock it in. Let's take a look. D, agoraphobia. Why is this agoraphobia? So why is this agoraphobia? I'm thinking that it's agoraphobia. Well, I picked my two favorite answers, right? Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, Sydney's family has become concerned because she has not left her apartment in several months without great difficulty. So she doesn't want to leave her apartment. Maybe it's a phobia. Maybe it's a social phobia. Yeah. I don't know. Sydney expresses that she doesn't want to leave the house because she doesn't want to leave, have a panic attack somewhere where she can't leave. Mm -hmm. And so this is specific to panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So it definitely is not generalized anxiety disorder, right. right? Because no one has talked about having different anxieties about different domains in Sydney's life, like her financial relationships mm -hmm. or other things. So it's not a, it's not, is it, how come it's not social, a specific phobia? Well, to, for me, it doesn't seem like it's a specific phobia because there's nothing specifically yeah. that she's afraid of. How come it's not specific anxiety attack disorder? Well, because specific anxiety attack disorder doesn't exist. I just threw that in there to trip you up. Yeah. And also, let's think about it. What is an anxiety attack? Do anxiety attacks exist? Anxiety attacks do not exist. Anxiety attacks do not exist. 
So we have talked about panic attacks, but we have never talked about anxiety attacks. So E is out, A is out. Right now we're in between either social phobia or agoraphobia. Yeah. And what makes it not social phobia? Well, I think the key with social phobia is fear of judgment or embarrassing yourself. And no front. one has talked about Sydney's being embarrassed. That's right. The only thing she's worried about is having a panic attack somewhere where she can't leave. Yeah, That's definitely agoraphobia. That makes me sound like it's definitely agoraphobia. All right, a therapist instructs her client to breathe forcefully in order to simulate the feelings of breathlessness and difficulty breathing associated with a panic attack. The purpose of this activity is to teach the client that these feelings are not inevitably indicative of something terrible happening to the body. What type of exposure therapy is this? Imaginal, in vivo, interoceptive, flooding, Bikram yoga. I know some of you thought E, I just know it, but it's okay. So what, what is it? Interoceptive, okay. So now we're gonna, yeah, so yeah. it wouldn't be imaginal. Because yeah. imaginal, I'm just thinking about it, right? And mm. that's all I'm doing. I'm just putting myself in that situation. Yeah. In vivo, well, in vivo means in life, right? So this yeah. is like a real world exposure. Yeah. Now, interoceptive, what is interoception? I do not know what interoception is. Well, so interoception is somebody's ability to sense their inner workings, right? Their inner sensations. Interoception. Oh, like. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of my heart rate. I'm aware of my breathing. I'm aware of my somatic sensations, mm. right? Yeah. So that's what we're doing with interoception, right? Right here, we want to try to feel the sense of like not being able to breathe. Yeah, and it's not Bikram yoga because we never talked about Bikram no, yoga. No, no, that's something I just threw in there to trip you up. No, it's not Bikram yoga. And also, it's not flooding because we know what flooding is. Yeah. Flooding is when I give you the maximum exposure to whatever you're afraid of. Yeah. And then try to like habituate it to that. All right, boom. There we go. That was good. I have a video. I'm going to go ahead and jump out of here real quick. We'll watch the video. When I was eight years old, my parents took my brother and me to the circus. While well, they waited in line for tickets, we played on the wheelchair ramp handlebars like they were monkey bars. We liked to climb and hang from them. But my brother and I didn't always get along, and we ended up getting into a small argument. He shoved me into the handlebar. My left shoulder hit the bar. But my automatic reaction wasn't a feeling of physical pain. It was a feeling of loss in my right arm. I could feel that. My left arm was cold from the metal and sore from the impact, but none of that was in my right arm. I was unbalanced. I was uncomfortable. My heart started to beat faster and my chest started to tighten. I needed the feelings in my left arm to exist in my right. So I got up and I ran myself into that bar, this time making sure to hit it with my right arm. But embarrassingly, I ran too quickly. I hit the bar too hard. So I got up again, and this time I made sure to hit it with my left arm. It was hard to ensure that my arms felt exactly the same, so I had to run into that bar multiple times, which left me with bruises so severe that I had to go to physiotherapy. When I was a child, I deduced that everything with respect to one's body needed to be symmetrical. If I touched something with my left hand, I automatically assumed I needed to repeat that action with my right. If this need for balance didn't come forth, I believed bad things would follow. I am not exactly sure what these bad things were, but I knew I was never willing to wait to find out. I'll explain what this feels like. It's like being underwater for an extended period of time. You're holding your breath, and it's scary. And without even thinking about it, your body naturally tells you that bad things will happen if you stay underwater. Your body tells you to fight to get out of that situation. That's the way my body felt every time I touched something asymmetrically. This feeling is not desirable, so I always touch things two, four, even eight times if necessary. This should have been an obvious indicator that I was different, but... Just like breathing, I honestly thought everyone did these things. I didn't even tell my parents I did these things. I thought nothing of my childish games that sought symmetry and relief. Just like younger Samantha, who was clearly unaware of her disorder, society often misinterprets the true meaning of OCD. I have searched the hashtag OCD on Instagram, and here are just a few examples of what you can find. 
OCD is an organized closet. OCD is an adjective you can use to describe the level of clean you can have your car. Apparently, OCD is also aesthetically appealing organized M&M candies. Sometimes, people can even be OCD-ish. And this last one's my personal favorite. Instagram now diagnoses people OCD in. Posts like this make me cringe. What is OCD really? OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. It's one of many anxiety disorders, and it all starts with the obsessions. The obsessions are the recurring uncomfortable thoughts and worries that lead to the compulsions. The compulsions are in response to those obsessions, attempting to satisfy them. And it becomes a disorder when your obsessions and compulsions take up so much of your time that you're unable to move through your day normally. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. My OCD manifests itself in a number of ways, but the three main concepts that I wrangle with are symmetry, perfectionism, and time management. The symmetry theory that I developed as a child has followed me to date. To this day, I am still terrified that bad things will happen if my interactions with objects occur in an asymmetrical manner. I spend a good portion of my time touching things twice or avoiding touching things at all. Ideally, I'd be able to go through the day touching nothing. This need for symmetry often moves beyond the physical and takes shape within my mind as well. While walking on city streets or even within my own home, I avoid the lines on the ground because I believe I can feel them beneath my feet. There is nothing scarier than the grout between the kitchen and bathroom tiles. Conveniently, I get to stand up here walking around on a carpet. I avoid door handles because the cold metal sensation takes a lot for me to recuperate from. Anytime I'm itchy, I'm really twice as itchy. Anytime anyone pats me on the back or shakes my hand, I have to fix it. Any sort of physical encounter requires a great deal of remediation. An average day for me means avoiding 32 different sections of lines on the ground. 60 fixes for any time anyone touches me or bumps into me. Mentally preparing for 124 door handles. 270 casual encounters any time I have to touch something and 420 itches. In total, that's 906 obsessive compulsive thoughts that occur within one day. And that's only symmetry related. I'm also a perfectionist. Growing up, I spent hours ensuring that my binders were nothing short of a perfectly color-coded textbook. I had a number of very specific rules that needed to be followed. Just a few included. All notes from one subject must be taken in a minimum of two colors. Notes must appear aesthetically balanced. The handwriting, the pen, and the paper must remain the same through the entire year. Absolutely no food stains, no grease stains, no creases, no crinkles, and in subjects where it was possible, notes should be retyped at home. I was always developing new rules for myself, and in the ninth grade, I decided that the best way to have a consistent binder was to have typed notes but I didn't have a laptop, so I took handwritten notes in class, I came home, and I typed my notes out on a desktop. I printed them, and I put them in my binder. And if at any point these notes became creased or crinkled, which of course they did, I would take them out of my binder, place them on my mother's ironing board, and iron them. I spent hours doing this. If at any point I looked down at my binders and I didn't see perfection, my heart would instantly begin to beat faster. My chest would tighten. I was so anxious that it hurt. It was easier to deal with my binders than to live with my own anxiety. But then I started university. In university, you don't have time to type up your notes or iron them so I stopped taking them, which, as you can imagine, had an adverse effect on my grades. But it doesn't end there. I also spend a great deal of my time on time management-related OCD. 
I always mentally prepare for my day. I always have a plan. I even plan to plan my next plan. Whenever I have work to do, I look at the number of tasks I have to do, the number of days I have to do it in, take one from the number of days to, of course, a lot for error, divide the number of tasks by this new number of days, and bam, I have a perfectly balanced week with proportionate amounts of work for every day. Conveniently, I have a degree in mathematics, so these minor daily calculations are fairly trivial. However, I often find myself in situations where I am incredibly anxious because I don't know where my day is going to lead me. Life doesn't always go as planned. The large theme within my OCD gravitates towards balance. It's fundamental in my symmetry, my perfectionism, and in the way I organize my day. Now, you may be asking yourselves, why or how does this add any real value or meaning into my everyday life? The need to double tap items, myself and even unfortunately other people, can truly be seen as a disadvantage. And while there are moments in my life that I would definitely agree with you, there is an overall understanding within me that life has a need for balance. Too often, I hear people refer to OCD casually as a joke or as a deficiency. OCD keeps me balanced. How many people can say they live a balanced life? I can assure you, this need for balance is not something that I came up with for the convenience of this talk. It's prominent throughout many cultures and traditions. Aristotle defined a healthy life as one with a balanced soul, with neither excesses nor deficiencies. In life, we all rely on balance to help ground us, to help make important decisions. My manifestation of balance is no doubt a compulsion to satisfy my disorder, but it does construct a mental model within me, one that guides me to lead a healthy life. Growing up, I maintained my work in such a way that would ensure balance and consistency. I rewrote notes. Yes, this took a lot of extra time and energy, but it was so beneficial to my learning. Repetition is generally a study tactic that teachers advise students to do, something my disorder forced me to do, making me naturally a good student. Again, rewriting, retyping notes, lots of time, lots of energy. But it speaks to my fundamental nature. I believe everything I do and produce is a direct reflection of me. So, I always try my best. I habitually give 110%. But at some point, as I said, my best stopped making sense. In university, I did stop taking notes. But then my dad gave me an iPad. I learned to take handwritten notes on an iPad. My notes were never crinkled or creased. They never had food or grease stains on them. And if I needed to, I could print these notes. This changed my life. This is a skill I've been able to share with students, colleagues, and friends. Students have different learning needs, and for some of them, the use of an iPad is beneficial. I have helped a number of different students adapt their learning to use an iPad as their primary note-taking device. But more importantly, through my OCD, I learned to be adaptable and open to new ideas. My need to equally distribute my work week may be quirky, but it's healthy. I regularly have time for work, leisure, and exercise. Over the years, I've strongly minimized doing last-minute work as the thought of an impending deadline gives me increased levels of anxiety, which generally means I produce better work. I often hear the expression, I work better under pressure. I have OCD. I am literally always under pressure. OCD has given me so many positives, but when I went to the doctors for help, they immediately offered me medication, and I strongly thought about taking it. But then I realized that so much of me is rooted in my OCD that I didn't want to get rid of it. I just wanted to handle it better, and ideally, one day, embrace it. All of my ambition and my intensity comes from my OCD, and I need that to be successful. Society and its need to normalize everyone is an attempt to create a standard we should all fit into, one that I just don't fit into. 
It's disheartening to think that anxiety disorders are seen as exclusively negative. As a community, we are becoming addicted to quick fixes like drugs, and we are not taking the time to appreciate the benefits of these conditions. I said no to drugs and said yes to CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. I am not here to say that anti-anxiety medication is unacceptable. I just felt that I would have lost a small piece of me if I had taken it. Doctors have told me I have an obsessive compulsive disorder, but I prefer to call it an obsessive compulsive advantage. Thank you. All right, so just before we get going on the rest of this video, I just want to touch on uh, what we just saw right there. Um, I think that's a, I think it's really good to watch people's lived experiences or hear about what they go through, these different disorders. And so this individual right here, you know, she definitely has some issues that she's been dealing with with OCD. So it's always really good to take some time and look at these kind of narratives. I would encourage you to go on the YouTube and look up other people's narratives about OCD and just to get an idea about the lived experience, the daily lived experience of what individuals uh, go through. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that that's something that gets really cut out from the DSM mm -hmm. and other medical models of psychopathology. We do not know people's lived experiences from meeting a diagnostic criteria. What is it actually like? What is the daily life of a yeah. person like that? It's definitely important to think about. Remember, even if you don't meet diagnostic criteria, you can still have you know, clinically significant levels of distress and impairment. So listening to some of these lived experiences can really help you out, even if someone hasn't uh, refused a diagnosis yet. Remember what I said before, if you've met a person with a particular disorder, you've met a person with that disorder because the presentations are totally different or it can be totally different depending on the person that you're looking at. So there, what do you think about it? What do you think about OCD? Let's think about before we watch that video. What did you think of when you heard the term OCD? Was it kind of like those Instagram posts? Did you think like OCD was being neat or orderly? Monica from Friends? Did you think about OCD being something where like you like aesthetically pleasing things or you want to check things just to make sure they're locked? You know, a lot of people will use the term OCD very casually to where now you're diminishing the lived experiences of those who've actually been diagnosed with OCD. And so sometimes people make light of OCD. When we go to personality disorders, I'm going to go over something called OCPD, which is Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. It is more accurate to say that for those who like to be neat and organized or who are just more structured, that they have OCPD traits rather than OCD. Now I know that's just a little small P, but that P makes all the difference. OCD used to be included as an anxiety disorder in the DSM-4. However, in the DSM-5, it's been switched around. So now that OCD has its own category. So the category in the DSM-5 is labeled as obsessive compulsive and related disorders. And that chapter is on covers. Okay, so for OCD, an individual can have obsessions, compulsions, or both. So you can have obsessions or compulsions or both. And it is more common to have both obsessions and compulsions. Now for obsessions, these are going to be recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, images that are ex they're experienced as being intrusive and unwanted. And in most cases, individuals with these obsessions are feeling intense levels of anxiety or distress. This can also be referred to as marked anxiety or distress. And these obsessions are going to be typically inappropriate to the situation. Then we have compulsions, and these compulsions are repetitive, behaviors, hand washing, ordering, checking, or mental acts, praying, counting, repeating words silently, that an individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. So most individuals with OCD do recognize that their obsessions and compulsions are irrational and they actually try to avoid doing them. However, they are unable to or cause intense distress and impairment when they attempt to do this. Now, these obsessions and compulsions are time consuming. So you spend about more than an hour per day doing them. So like you have to spend a lot of time checking things or these obsessions and compulsions cause significant distress and impairment. How is obsession different from worry, right? Some of you might be thinking that. Well, worry involves common daily problems. So it's like, oh, I should probably make sure the oven is off because that's a good thing. I should make sure that my door is locked because that's a good thing. I should make sure that my notes are organized for my presentation because that's a good thing. Obsession, different. Obsession comes out of the blue. It's not really connected to any particular thing. Obsession usually involves some kinds of 
a theme. An obsession I mean, like, usually involves some kind of socially unacceptable behavior. So let's take a look at, at this little question right here for some review. Well, Nick engages in the mental activity of counting to five every time he enters a new room. If he gets interrupted or messes up the sequence, he has to start over. This could be an example of an obsession or a compulsion. A or B. The 50-50 shot. You already know. All right, that's a compulsion. So let's move on to obsessions. Obsessions are typically about normal things, but the intensity is different when it comes to individuals with OCD. So there are actually five categories of typical obsessions. We have contamination. So the obsession is contamination. The compulsion would be like washing your hands. And we have obsessions being doubts. So this could be something like forgetting to turn off the stove. This could be like the checking thing. I need to check the doors. The next obsession right here, we have order. For order, this is like needing things to be neatly organized, categorized, have like some, have symmetry. Order could be, I'm obsessed that everything has to be in order. My compulsion is I'm organizing everything. So another obsession could be losing control. It's like about my emotions. Like I'm fearful that I'm going to get angry or aggressive. or I'm going to hurt somebody. That could be another obsession, possible need. This is also known as hoarding. So I have these objects here. I could need them in the future. Can't really get rid of them. You don't know what's going to happen. There's a great show about this. I would uh, recommend watching it. Quick uh, stats here. We've went over the five most common obsessions. Important note to have about OCD is that individuals are not limited to one type of obsession. You can have multiple types of obsessions. About 60% of individuals diagnosed with OCD have multiple obsessions. 60% of individuals diagnosed with OCD have multiple obsessions. Hmm. Why would I repeat that twice? That's wow. Wow. Hmm. Okay. So here's a video. Howie Mandel used to be a stand up comedian, but now he does shows. Look about the OCD. Jump off the way. We'll watch the video. All right. So before we jump into that video, so I do want to point out, I don't know if I touch on this later in this video, but like, so we're in the middle of a pandemic. So being worried about contamination might not necessarily align with OCD because there's like a real, there's like a, you know, a legitimate reason why you might want to continuously wash your hands, keep social distance, you know, use hand sanitizer, things like that. So remember, like even in, during this pandemic, you can still have a contamination obsession with OCD, but it's going to have to be it outside you know of the normal range exactly of being warranted another thing that i wanted to talk about is that in the beginning we said that obsessions were sometimes not socially acceptable things and that is often manifested in people right so for example women who give birth often have these obsessive intrusive thoughts about killing their children mm -hmm. um but it's not their desire and i think we'll talk about that later right egocentonic versus ego dystonic mm -hmm. so this uh idea that these um intrusive thoughts are not actually their desires but um intrusive it's a good point to bring up all right there we go so remember wash your hands wear a mask social distance all right you see what i'm talking about kids we want to watch this video about Howie Mandel. We're going to touch on this a little bit later. Crippling and mysterious disease that makes everyday life a minefield for some 5 million Americans. ED, or obsessive compulsive disorder. And one of those people is superstar comedian Howie Mandel. On stage, he makes millions of people laugh, but off stage, he can't shake hands with them, or touch a doorknob, or a glass, or even be with his own family at times. Here's David Muir. It's 7 o'clock in the morning, and Howie Mandel arrives at the set of Deal or No Deal. First record of the day. Almost immediately, glimpses of the Howie Mandel that he's kept secret for most of his career. Handrails are my enemy. I never go near a handrail. I won't open those things. <laughs> I would never serve myself. I wouldn't touch this, because a lot of people have touched that. This is actually my, my nightmare. Mandel has obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. I love this. Every door should just push out. His obsession, germs, an obsession made famous with his trademark fist bump. And what's the difference between shaking the hand and, and the fist bump? In my mind, this is a petri dish. Otherwise, I would spend the day as I have in the past in my life in the men's room rubbing and scrubbing and scalding. But as we were about to learn, Howie Mandel's OCD goes far beyond that fist bump. Off stage, it is all consuming. Look, everything's brand new each day. That's normally how a workstation looks. <laughs> Look at my stuff. It's all brand new, not touched. Even Mandel's trademark bald head is this way by choice. This feels so streamlined and so clean. You know, it just it feels works. cleaner. 
not even 8.30 in the morning, and we've barely scratched the surface. Mandel has written a new book called Here's the Deal, Don't Touch Me, revealing his, at times, crippling struggle with OCD. It's, it's uncomfortable, and it's, it's hard, and uh, it's somewhat embarrassing. There were many times when I wanted to back out. I'm not somebody who sits down with strangers as I sit here. We go way back. But it's not only you, it's them. Mandel's fans would never know just how deep it goes. Until now, the audience had only heard this. You and Mandel does not shake hands, okay? You, Mandel does not shake hands. You can hug him. You can knuckle him, you just can't shake his hands. Backstage, it's the rush to the set. <laughs> Holly Mandel has been on stage for 30 years now, first making his mark as a manic young comic from Toronto. There would be more than 20 appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I've been carrying this for about two months now. It's a lucky rabbi's foot. <laughs> See, a lot of folks would think that's what would set off a panic attack, is sitting next to Johnny Carson, your idol. That's totally different than the fear that OCD injects into my life, which is a terror. He would go on to star in the TV drama St. Elsewhere. That's Dr. Twerk to you. He was the voice of Gizmo in Gremlins. And Bobby in Bobby's World. I don't think you should plug that in. His daytime talk show. Here's how He had a short run. Years went by. And then just as he considered bowing out of show business altogether, the phone call that he first considered an insult. Your wife called this one, though, right? Yeah, my wife said, take it. Take the deal. Mandel tells us he never could have predicted the show's success. An audience of nearly 20 million viewers an episode. Nor did he imagine he'd ever be talking about his mental illness. You dropped the pill. Yeah. As our camera rolls. Yeah, it's right here. He drops the one anxiety pill he brought with him to the set. I don't want you to touch the floor, and I won't touch the floor. <laughs> I mean, now it's coming off like crazy. And it's, I, why? I'm not going to take it. To this day, Mandel is in therapy and on medication for the anxiety that comes with his OCD. He won't say which kind because he knows the millions of adults suffering from OCD are also looking for a cure-all. For him, this latest medication came after working with his own doctor and therapist. But you only brought one pill from the hotel. Yeah. So that means you'll go without it rather than have the one pill that you have. Right. This is precisely the kind of moment Howie Mandel kept secret for so many years until he let it slip, his battle against OCD on The Howard Stern Show. You know, I'm, I've got a germ fetish. What is your big fear? You're going to get a disease? You're going to get sick? Yeah. Did you want to take it back immediately? It was devastating to me. You know, I, I was incredibly embarrassed and I thought I had humu humiliated my family and I thought that this was going to be the end of my career because people are going to know that I do have mental health issues. It was like, what, what have I just done? What did I do? What did I do? It wasn't funny. It wasn't funny, but it was real. And like the 40 million American adults who suffer from anxiety disorders, Mandel's began when he was just a child. He remembers as far back as six years old. They would make fun of me because I couldn't tie my shoes. Well, I could, but I didn't want to touch it. But I don't want to say I'm afraid to touch it because it's dirty, so I didn't. The battle in his mind was constant. I had like a fight going on inside. Like I gotta wash my hands or I feel filthy or I haven't spent enough time in the shower or I, you know, there's, there's something still crawling on me. There wasn't really a point in living anymore. Mandel is aware of the children we've reported on here after documenting their struggle with OCD for more than a year. Their own fears of germs had become debilitating. Like Bridget, afraid of germs from her own family, unable to sit on the same couch as her mother. Oh, no, don't, no. don't! Okay. There was Michelle, who spent hours in her shower under the scalding water. I pulled her out of the shower and she just sat on the floor and rocked and cried. And there was Rocco, who begs his mother to reassure him every day that he won't get sick at school. Honey, I don't know what you're saying. I don't remember what I said about the day. You'll have a great day. Why do you do this? I said a, I said a couple things. Mandel sees himself in those children. He said he was an outcast in school, his humor out of bounds. Expelled from high school, he never finished. But he would find the stage, a place for his comedy, and a young woman who found his brand of humor charming. Thirty years later, she sits beside him as his wife, and both remember the title of his first featured act. Borderline psychotic. When you look back at that marquee, how did they know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the first time you saw the rubber glove? Yes. I thought it was nuts. Like, what? But I thought it was hysterical. But even then, the rubber gloves were no joke, carrying them for more than his act. And you knew that at the time? We didn't know it was OCD then, but we just, I did know that he took a lot of showers. He had certain rituals that he did, but I didn't know what it was. She also didn't know it would get worse. In describing what life is like, Mandel pointed us to the movie The Aviator. Remembering the portrayal of Howard Hughes, he said there were striking similarities. At the end, he ends up naked in a room, locked away, uh, urinating into a bottle. And he doesn't want to face the world. And I said, you know, there are times 
and, and it's, I'm not excited when I'm that close to that. How many times do you think have you been that close to that scene, kind of trapped in a room? There's a couple times, moments in a month, when it's just hard, when it's just hard to go out or, or you know, face anything. A couple of times a month, paralyzed by his fears, and we wonder, how was he able to be a father? How did you raise three children? It was tough. It was tough. <laughs> the kids, when they were crawling on the floor, everything bought, it was so hard for him. And there was this, a second house built in the backyard for Mandel to escape the germs of his own family. A solitary place where only Howie Mandel would go. And it's embarrassing and it's hard, especially in front of your child. We have constantly told the kids daddy's uh, behavior in those moments is not something to be emulated. Are you able to hug, kiss, touch? Hug, kiss, do everything. It's just for whatever reason, it's the hands. It's the hands. I mean, if somebody's sick, I'll leave the room. Even the kids, if the kids are sick. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I, well, if the kids are sick, I'll put on a mask. When my wife's sick, I won't sleep in the same room, and I don't eat in the same room. I care for them, and I, uh, I'll be there, but I, you know, it's You'll be there down the hall. Down the hall. You wonder if the kids thought you were a surgeon at one point. Being somewhat, uh, trying to be a little bit entertaining. But they there aren't many dads who walk around the house with Yeah, but you know what, the, the, the truth of the matter is, whoever your dad is, or whoever your family is, that's your norm. As parents, they chronicle the family trips. But the whole story was never captured on video. Look over here, Jackie. My daughter was a teenager, and she crossed her leg, and the bottom of her shoe touched his leg. And we were, like, halfway to the airport. And he starts saying, you got to take me home, because that was on the floor, and the floor is dirty, and it touched his pants. And think about the germs on his leg. So what do you think about that video? I thought it was great. I thought it was a different type of lived experience than the first video. You can definitely see the range of how this can manifest and it looks so vastly different than the first one. Mm -hmm. In the first one we see how this woman afflicted with OCD thinks about uh, very minute things and the process in which she thinks about it. So for example she talked about if she's uh, if her hand is if somebody shakes her hand she needs to shake the other one. Mm -hmm. In this other video, we saw a, a, a more of a bird's eye view on what it looks like, right? So this man who tries to hide it, mm -hmm. we saw the shame in mm -hmm. having it. Yeah. So and all the pain and discomfort that it caused and everything. Yeah. And then we dropped that pill and he couldn't reach out and pick it up. And that was the only one that he had. Yeah. But also on the bright side, we kind yeah. of saw how he was able to still achieve a lot in his life. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have impairment without distress. I mean, you can have distress without impairment. Well, you so he probably has some kind of impairment. You think so? But not but for, for example, but his overall life yeah isn't impaired. His you know, overall life isn't impaired. So like, like his like his ability to have a job, mm -hmm. to, you know, have a family, that isn't impaired, right? So he like he's not like completely his life isn't stunted. Mhm. Mm but it's probably impairment in other areas. But that, that probably it's an impairment where it doesn't really get in the way of his ability to actually have a life. Mm. You know, because sometimes we think about impairment, we think about, oh, you're, you're going to be destitute. Mm -hmm. Whereas what, what impairment might be is difficulties in functioning in a particular area, which he probably has. He probably does have that. Yeah. yeah. But like his life isn't thrown out because he has OCD. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what some people think about when they hear impairment. They think about, oh, well, the guy on the street who can't take care of himself, that's impairment. And it can be different. So impairment is also on a spectrum, right? From low impairment to high impairment. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Something to think about. Ooh, there we go. All right. Let's listen to the rest of this. OCD. And as you see right there, it affects him a variety of areas of his life. There's a lot of stress and a lot of impairment. So June often finds herself preoccupied with whether her garage door is closed, whether she turned the lights off in her house, or remembered to turn off the sink after brushing her teeth. As a result of these obsessions regarding blank, June spends several hours every day driving home to check whether she did these things. So is this an obsession of contamination, obsession of losing control, obsession of doubts, obsession of order, or obsession of death and dismemberment? Okay, so go ahead and think about that for a second. Answer 
is doubts. So remember, doubts is like checking things, right? You're not sure if you did the thing you were supposed to do. So you're checking it. So let's talk about some related disorders to OCD. We have like body dysmorphic disorder. So this is like an obsession, preoccupation with deficits in your appearance. And the compulsion associated with this might be things like excessive exercise, plastic surgery, things of that nature. We have trichotillomania. This is recurrent pulling of, some, of your hair, resulting in hair loss. We have hoarding. This is persistent difficulty, discarding or parting with possessions. Uh, we have excoriation. This is recurrent skin picking, resulting in skin lesions. So these are the disorders that are related related to OCD. And there's more information on this in the DSM-5 chapter. I would encourage you all to read it. So like we said before, with OCD, individuals understand that their obsessions and compulsions are unreasonable. So one person who wants to like try to stop these compulsions might engage in thought suppression. So they have this compulsion to do the thing that they need to do to, to counteract the obsession. The obsession might be something bad is going to happen to my mother if I don't check this thing. So having that thought now all of a sudden puts me into this state where I'm like, okay, I have to do this thing to stop something bad from happening to my mother. Now, the idea of not preventing something bad from happening to my mother is the same sensation as if I've caused this in the first place. I'm taking full responsibility for these outcomes for my mother. And I'm not taking into account the low probability of occurrence or all these other outside factors. If I decide not to take action, if I decide not to step in, that's the same thing as if I actually wanted to hurt my mother. So it's not like I could have helped my mother and I refused to help her or I failed in helping her, but it's like almost like I wanted to hurt her. I didn't want to help her. And then there's this larger pull that I should be able to control my thoughts and I should be able to get myself out of this, this compulsion here. But all these things are conflicting and this can cause a lot of issues. One thing that people have been led to believe, and that kind of touches on what you were talking about with those mothers when they had those those thoughts about their, their, their children. Like they don't want to have those thoughts. Yeah, it's not their, their own desire to kill their babies. But those intrusive thoughts are met, said to be ego dystonic, coming outside of the desire from the self. And that's some controversial topics right there. You might think about OCD is that someone should just suppress these intrusive thoughts. Researchers have looked into this. They found that thought suppression isn't as easy as it sounds. And this is due to the rebound effect. So let's talk about that for a second. Okay, so the rebound effect occurs in a feedback loop between like the prefrontal cortex which controls thought processes and the amygdala and other limbic regions that control emotion. So like the cingulate gyrus, this is like your conscious emotional control. So this feedback loop links the prefrontal cortex to regions with emotion. People vulnerable to develop OCD react strongly to events that trigger an emotional response. So you have this predisposition to overreact emotionally to events. This emotional response then leads to a suppression of the emotional response because you find it unpleasant. So you want to try to suppress that response, right? But your efforts to suppress that response lead to the rebound effect. And this rebound effect strengthens over time the connection between emotions and thoughts. So this is how the rebound effect works right here. So I'm predisposed to be very emotionally reactive. Then I ch I meet some kind of event. This is an emotionally distressing event, right? Which triggers my amygdala and my limbic regions, which then goes to my prefrontal cortex. I realize, uh-oh, I'm feeling this way about this event. So now I want to suppress these feelings. So I'm going to try to suppress this emotional response. And so when I try to express that emotional response, what happens is it ends up strengthening my emotional mood. So the more... I suppress these emotions, the more aware I become of these emotions, which then strengthens that association, makes me think about it more, and so it goes back and forth. So this is reciprocal causality. I try to suppress the emotions, the emotions get stronger. So I'm thinking about them more, I try to suppress them more, they get stronger, and it goes back and back and forth. And this connection is then reinforced over time. Every time I encounter some of this event right here that triggers this emotional response, I get caught into the cycle, this reinforcement that causes a lot of distress. This is where, this is the connection between the obsessions and the compulsions. All right, so if any of that was confusing to you, didn't make sense, send me an email, come to office hours. Just a little bit of review here. We're looking at how hyperactivity to an emotional trigger leads to attempts to suppress emo emotions. The more you suppress, the more you aware you become. This leads to a quick review. You see that right there, ideology. What's ideology? Huh? What's the answer? Causes What's of psychopathology. Well, you were supposed to answer. They're supposed to answer. Sorry. All right. Well, that's what it is. All right. You should know what ideology is. What's epidemiology? 
Huh? Huh? I can't. I can't help you out anymore. Exactly. I got exactly. You need to study your definitions. All right. Let's keep watching. Greater emotional reaction and more attempts to suppress. So this is the rebound effect that we were talking about on the prior slide, and this strengthens the connection between emotions and thoughts over time. That's the most important thing to re, uh, to understand about the rebound effect. It strengthens the connection between emotions and thoughts over time. Over here, we got some more review for you. So Cynthia comes to her first meeting with a therapist presenting with mood symptoms. While she is talking, her therapist notices that Cynthia's body movement is repetitive, She's shrugging her shoulders, stuff like that. Based on this, what might the therapist assume Cynthia has? So we have A, obsessions, B, compulsions, C, tics, like, like you know, physical tics, D, involuntary psychomotor agitation, E, not enough information to determine. So go ahead and think about that for a second. Let's take a look at the answer. All right, the answer is not enough information to determine. All right, so let's talk, that's a good one right there. Let me back up real quick, just to get that back on the screen. So it's not enough information to determine. Yeah. Okay. Why is that a good option right there? Well, because all we know is that Cynthia's body movement is repetitive. That is all we know. Mm -hmm. And so, can obsessions be responsible for this? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. What about compulsions? Mm -hmm. Maybe, Maybe, right? Yeah. What about tics? Possibly. Possibly. What about involuntary psychomotor agitation? Maybe. Maybe. One of the things that really kicks off for me yeah. is the first sentence. Cynthia comes to her first meeting with a therapist presenting with mood symptoms yeah so this is their first meeting first meetings right off the bat so can i really diagnose somebody with something during the first meeting i don't believe so yeah. no and don't do that either you know you don't want to like the first meeting this isn't it, this really isn't how therapy works you don't just like show up to an office and the doctor's like yeah i know exactly what you got maybe they have some working hypotheses or something like that but it takes time to diagnose somebody it takes time to figure out so go back to that DSM-5 chapter, look at that little red-pink box, this salmon-colored box, and look at the symptoms, look at the diagnostic criteria that you would need to diagnose somebody with OCD. Well, how much time must pass? Is this like just one obsession? Is this just like one compulsive event? Or is there a, a pattern? Is there like a series that you have to like meet criteria for? So right here with this, what do you have? I mean, do we have enough? We do not, we absolutely do not have enough information to determine why Cynthia's body movements are repetitive. Mm. But we might have more information later on with more examinations, with more sessions, maybe do some measures, stuff like that. Yeah. All right, there we go. So let's talk about epidemiology. So when we look at onset of OCD, males and females have equal risk of development. Did you know the answer? What's epidemiology? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. The study of rates prevalence of a disorder. So think about numbers, think about stats. These are things like lifetime prevalence, 12 month prevalence, stuff like that. All right. Who, who gets the disorder? How often? So that's what you want to think about with epidemiology. Remember, epidemiology, upon people study. Okay, study what befalls upon a people. Helping OCD, so there's no sex differences in the onset. So for males, onset is between uh, the ages of six and 15 years of age. And for females, the onset is between the ages of 20 and 29. So males have an earlier age of onset between six and 15 years of age. And females have a later age of onset between the ages of 20 and 29. There are gonna be some initial sex differences in childhood, but over a long enough period of time, these sex differences will equal out. And when looking across cultures and racial and ethnic groups, there seems to be a relatively um, equal prevalence. The course of OCD goes through like the symptoms start small, they're very gradual, and then they reach the level of diagnostic criteria. So over one's lifetime, symptoms might wax and wane, becoming particularly evident during stressful situations. When we look at epidemiology here, we see that there's a one-year prevalence, about 1% 1 of the population. For comorbidity, about 50% of people with OCD have an anxiety disorder. And then with OCD, we see that about 20% also have a, you know, a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. So back in the day, when people were trying to prevent um, compulsions, they physically restrain somebody. However, nowadays we kind of think about trying to be more empathic when it comes to treating OCD. So because OCD has two components, obsessions and compulsions, the treatment has two targets. So because OCD has two components, the obsessions and the compulsions, the treatment has two targets, exposure and response. So this is where exposure and response prevention comes from. The general idea here is to expose people to obsessive cues 
This would be like dirty things, et cetera, whatever the triggers are, right? And then prevent the individual from engaging in their compulsive behaviors, hand washing, checking, etc. So this is going to reduce the anxieties caused by the obsessions by habituating the individual to those emotions. So first, you want to gather information about rituals and enable the client the ability to monitor them, monitor their rituals effectively. So this is going to be repeated, prolonged exposure to situations that provoke anxiety. And then you're going to give the client instructions to refrain from the ritual behavior. Behaviors. Client is often going to receive instructions to keep a record of ritualistic behaviors, homework assignments, to expose themselves to other forms of anxiety provoking stimuli. So the reason for pushing clients in this way is to show them that nothing bad really happens when they're exposed to these triggers. It comes to this form of treatment, there's a lot of uh, treatment dropout because clients just find the exposure to that stimuli very, um, well, it's distressing. People with very debilitating forms of OCD might not even make it to treatment. So this is kind of like a downside of this exposure and response prevention treatment for OCD. All right, so I have a video here. Let's go over it real quick. Okay, you did it. That was a really good job. With many disorders, if the impairment is too high, they're not gonna go to treatment. If, for example, depression is too high, they're not gonna get out of bed. They can make a phone call to schedule an appointment with a therapist. If anxiety is too high, they can focus on mm -hmm. calling a therapist. Yeah, and when we go into substance use disorders, a lot of uh, like recovery centers have a high treatment dropout. So even if people end up going to treatment, they definitely drop out within like the first couple of weeks. And it's because it's very um, distressing and debilitating. And we'll talk about more about that later, but that's a good point to think about. Um, how do you feel? A little better. A little better? Okay. All right, what's your level right now? Um... I would say like 60. 60, okay, down a bit. Okay, so now we move into the in vivo exposure, right? Okay, remember, we're gonna just, for the next 40 minutes or so, handle that leash. Um, allow yourself to have whatever thoughts that come up or worries you have about it. You can verbalize them, talk about whatever's in your head, okay? Why don't you pull it out of the bag? Did you put it in that bag? No, I asked my husband to. <laughs> uh. All right, what's your level right now? <sighs> I would say 65. 65, okay. All right. What are you thinking? That is disgusting, I don't wanna to touch it. Okay. Hold a little closer to your body, maybe hold it with two hands. <laughs> What do you notice about it? It's a lot of hair. Hair? Mm -hmm. And stains. Mm. What do you think the stains are? I don't want to think about it. Um, I don't know. Saliva, dog poop, it smells so bad. Mm. I'm starting to get sick. Okay, that's all right. Ugh. Just let it happen. It's okay. What's that spot on it? Looks almost like it's breaking or chewed up or something. Is that? Yeah. Mm. He chews on it. Why don't you touch that spot? <sighs> Ugh. Okay. You're doing good. I know it's hard. It's good. What's your level? Like 90. 90, okay. What, what jump? What are you thinking? What made it jump? What's going on? Now? I'm just thinking I'm going to get sick. Okay. I really want to vomit right now. And what if that part I touched had saliva? And what if the dog had, like, they have all sorts of things in their mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they even lick their own butts, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And then he chewed on that leash and you're holding that leash. Wow. Yeah. You're brave. Good for you. Okay. You also notice you're kind of holding it away from yourself. Let me show you something. Can I hold it? Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> that is quite a leash. It's old. Yeah. And it has been chewed on, hasn't it? So watch this. Okay. Mmm. You hold it? It's 
so I have to do that now. Yeah, I'm not going to make you do anything, you know that. But I think that the more kind of full body contact you can have with that leash, the better the exposure we're doing, okay? Good. All right, what's going through your mind? That I'm getting all the bacteria in my skin and that I want to take a shower right now. Okay. So your urge to wash is coming up. Yeah. How strong is it? Give me a rating on that zero to 100 scale for your urge to wash right now. Like 80. 80, okay. Okay. That means you're doing good expo. Oh, good for you. <laughs> on your face. Oh, Mia, that's great. Mm. What else are you thinking? Just keep telling me what's on your mind. Um, I'm just thinking of all the times I saw the dog biting on it, mm -hmm. licking on it. So is saliva worse than other things? Yeah. The dog saliva anyway? It's just, yeah, I can't feel it in my hands. So what is it that makes saliva worse? What's it so the bad? The smell, the consistency, and I know they have bacteria there. Okay. So it's a bigger source of the bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Right. Just keep thinking that then. That's okay. Good. I'm scared I'm going to make myself sick and then I touch my baby and I make him sick. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're realizing things that you, I don't think you've described to me before, just handling that thing. Huh? Yeah. How long has it been since you've touched that leash without gloves? <laughs> like five years. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I so used this, to this... get the gloves even bleached because I don't want to mm. touch the gloves. You mean after you used them, if you had to walk the dog, you would bleach them? Okay. Where are those gloves now? I threw them away because you asked me to. Good. Good for you. Good. Okay. Well, after doing this, you can take them for a walk anyway mm. without them, right? Maybe. What's your level now? Um, like 60. 60, okay. All right. Huh, it's going down a bit. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's what we talked about, that at the beginning, just the fear of thinking of getting the leash makes me more anxious. Okay. So I get that anticipatory anxiety, mm. and then the more I touch it and the more I get used to it, I guess I have each way. Okay. So one of the, thing that hel one of the things that helps in a moment like this is to try to sort of up the exposure a little bit. Can you put it around your neck? Sort of let it touch the upper part of your body. How's that feel? Disgusting. Disgusting. Okay. What's your level? Like 70. Okay. It's okay. So we're going to do this whole session? Yeah. You've been at it for, I think, about eight minutes or so. Seven minutes. We're going to do it longer. Now touch it to your face again. That was really good when you did that before. Good. Could even touch it to your lips. You're killing me. Mm. Mm. It smells so bad. It smells bad, yeah. You're doing great though. I know this is hard. Yeah. I know it's hard, but you're doing a really, really good job. And this is going to help. It's also going to make it a little bit easier to do what I'm going to ask you to do for homework, which is to take it home again and to touch it every day. So part of your homework will be not only to listen to that imaginal exposure recording that we made, but also to spend about an hour just holding on to that thing, touching your body with it, 
using it to kind of contaminate other things in the house, furniture, other surfaces, your clothing. You can tie it around your waist while you do things at home. So yeah, that was a really good example of some in vivo therapy. What do you think about that? I thought it was really great. It seemed like the therapist did a lot of work before this step. Um, and the, it, as you can tell, it was incredibly hard for the client to do these steps. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to think about. This is a process. So like we were talking about earlier, yeah. like you don't just like show up in one session and everything gets fixed. It takes some time. So you can tell there's a lot of trust, a lot of rapport built between the therapist and the client. And now they're at the advanced stage where they're, you know, going to in vivo exposure. And the therapist also mentioned imaginal exposure. She did. So they had that recording that they mm -hmm. made together. So they go home. She, she listens to that imaginal exposure tape. It's probably something that they created so she can use it on her own time. And this really helps to just keep rewriting those thoughts. Yeah. All right. So let's finish up uh, this video right here. And then we'll, we'll finish up uh, our little conversation. That's going to be the end of our lecture for today. If you have any questions, go ahead and send me an email. Come to office hours. There's going to be some additional information regarding obsessive compulsive disorders available in the reading folder on Compass. Make sure you review the DSM-5 chapter. I did not go over everything in this lecture. I want you to go ahead and read the DSM-5 chapter, obsessive compulsive disorder. So I'll be able to tell who read the chapter and who didn't when it comes to the next quiz. So everybody, that's it. That's the end of the lecture for today. Once again, send me an email, come to office hours. All right, have a good one. All right, so then I guess that's the end of uh, of our little lecture. It is, yeah. So to summarize what we learned today, we learned about obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. We learned about the obsessions and the compulsions, which are two separate but related aspects of the disorder. Mm -hmm. Obsessions have to do with the mind, the thoughts, intrusive thoughts. Um, compulsions have to do with behavior, right? Um, what else? Well, we also looked at some of the treatments available. We also looked at some lived experiences. We also learned a little bit about some of the stigma attached with OCD. We also learned about some of the ways that people make light of OCD by using it too casually. Yeah. We've also learned that... You know, a lot of a lot of individuals who struggle with OCD are still able to um, achieve some success in their life and live the kind of life they want to live with help and treatment and therapy and things like that. We learned that impairment is on a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? To, when you think about impairment, it's not necessary to be destitute, but any type of impairment that the individual deems to be counter to their goal mm -hmm. would could be considered impairment. We also learned about etiological factors related to OCD. Um, we learned about the processes that may be involved in the brain. Um, we learned about epidemiological factors. There's a lot. Yeah. So once again, if you have questions after this lecture, there's the emails right up here. Boom, boom. Listen. Go ahead and send the emails. It's fine. Send the emails. But also, check that online DSM-5. You have the DSM-5 links on your page, right? I do. Absolutely. So both sections, CD, INJ, you have the, the readings, you have the DSM-5 chapters, and you have the emails. So go ahead and get to work. Do what you got to do. That's it for us today. Did you have anything else to add? Come to my office hours. Just show up. I will be updating you on office hours this week. Um, so just show up to my office hours. I have office hours as well. So go and show up to my office hours if you're in my section. And then I also there's also the in-person discussion sessions that we have. We now have in-person discussion sections. Can you tell the audience a little bit about the in-person discussion yeah, sections? Yeah, sure. No problem. So we have Mondays and Tuesdays. Monday is going to be 1 to 2 p.m. And then Tuesdays is 10 to 11 a.m. And that's going to be in the psych building, room 142. You got to like g make sure you get tested so you have your Safer Illinois app so you can access the building. Then you got to go down to the basement and walk across and then walk up the stairs because, you know, they're doing that construction atrium. But that's that's open to all sections. So you just sign up online. There's a, There should be a link on your Compass page. There's emails in your inbox about that. But if you have questions about the in-person discussion sessions, sign up for that. You can email your instructor or you can email me directly. And then I'll give you the information that you need. But that's going to be it for today. 
So there you go. We're signing off. Taking it easy. All right, peace.